Howdy everybody, I'm back to geek out again. I do apologize for the really, really long um, hiatus between uh, my last geek out video and this one. I was a little bit busy with work, well, mostly getting used to work and also worn out by work, but also because, well, quite frankly, my workbench was just a complete and total mess, and it still is. But um, it's a little bit less of a mess after I've you know worked on sorting my room out just a little just a little bit. Um, but I am back with another geek out video. I don't have my notebook this time because, well, quite frankly, I'm actually going to be making something with, in this video, so you get to watch me work. But uh, for the moment, though, I want to go over a little bit of a post birthday um, rundown of some things because, well. I have a new microphone. I bought a new microphone. I've been, you know, tweeting pictures about it and stuff like that. But you can probably hear just through the quality of the audio in this video that, uh, well, I'm not exactly using my microphone. And that's because, well, unfortunately, I don't exactly have, because, um, well, unfortunately, I don't exactly have a good place to plug it in at the moment. Um, I've tested it, so it works. So I have plugged it in somewhere. It's just the place that I have to plug it in is just not the best place to plug it in. So instead, I'm going to make a place to plug it in. And uh, well, actually, I should probably just show it, show this microphone to you. Oh my gosh, XLR cables have such a snug fit, I swear. But yeah, I basically spent $60 on this really, really nice, um, really, really nice and shiny um, uh, powered condenser microphone and whatnot and it's sixty dollars not just for this alone like it it's sixty dollars for the microphone and a whole set of equipment to go with it like for example it even comes with a it also came with a phantom power supply 48 volts so you know 18 volts in for um, 18 volts in 48 volts out to the microphone to power it and then it produces a line level signal it goes out to the PC but it also came with this it came with a boom arm a um, it came with a boom arm a mount to mount the microphone to the boom arm a couple of pop filters and XLR cables to connect everything together so I mean this is a really really nice you know professional looking microphone professional sounding microphone and um, well Obviously, I need a place to plug in the power brick because, well, the power brick is just absolutely massive and it is so weighty. It feels like it's got a very generous transformer inside of it. And I'm probably going to do a, a teardown of both the power brick and the power supply um, in my next video before I start officially using this microphone because once I start using this microphone, I probably won't be able to find a good excuse to tear these things down. So... I'm probably going to do a, a quick teardown of these in my next video um, just to see what they're like because this power brick just has a lot of weight in it. It feels like it's got a very beefy, very beefy transformer inside of it. And I'm going to be very interested to see what's in here. But for now, though, I'm using the microphone built into my webcam for the moment. But I'm just like really squeeing hard about that microphone because it's so nice it's an omnidirectional condenser mic as well it's got a super cardioid pickup pattern so i mean that means that on the like behind the microphone you know it doesn't pick up sound as well but it does pick up sound so like if you're conducting you know in the field interviews or something you basically would have to hold the microphone you know pretty close to the person you're interviewing um unless you're unless you're like holding it sideways unless you're holding it sideways relative to you know yourself and your interviewee but you know it's still it's and you know it's still you know a nice microphone so yeah i'm going to be using that shortly but for now though no microphone because well i don't have a good place to plug it in so with uh, oh and uh i actually have other things to talk about as well before i get to the build um i actually have couple of really nice presents to show off. Mostly, I'm going to be switching to using these on my notebook instead of these, um, you know, instead of these, instead of, you know, these uh, cheap Sharpies that, you know, produce super thick lines on paper that the camera, that, you know, is sometimes hard to see on the camera. I'm going to be using these. These are used by the YouTuber Great Scott. Um, and 
a really, really good friend, a really good friend of mine, real sweetheart, Ellipsis, got these for me as a gift, and so yeah, this is going to be really fun to work with, and um, I'm eventually going to make a nice holder for these once I get a nice uh, blank of wood to work with. I'm waiting for that, um, waiting for that from my father, um, but I do have these to play with, and um, my roommate was also digging through boxes in the garage. And he found a box that has a few other things that I like to play with. I found my tools that I had to get for aviation ground school. So it's my CP1 plotter, my E6B flight computer, which is basically a fancy circular slide rule. I'll probably make a video about how to use probably make a video about how to use a slide rule because because uh, well quite frankly even with this it only has the C and D scales on it um, but you can still even if you're not a, a pilot that actually uses this for you know for like flight planning and whatnot you can still use this for like you know multiplication and division without a calculator so I'll probably make a video about this in the future and I also found my aeronautical charts for the Atlanta region so I'm probably gonna get back into you know studying how to use this stuff again because I really want to get a private pilot's license so it's nice that uh, it's nice that I found these uh, let's see here and that microphone was a gift to myself oh also um, while going through those boxes, my roommate also found the box that contains the little box that has a whole bunch of other, that has, um, that had the rest of my missing, uh, electronics tools. So I was able to find my multimeters, both of them, including this cheapo that I got years and years and years ago as a Christmas gift. And then this that I also got from my father a couple years back as a gift. But because, uh, well, quite frankly, that cheap little multimeter was not terribly accurate as far as readings goes because it's, um, well, obviously you could you could see it was a galvanometer type. This is a digital display, so it's a lot more accurate to read. Um, you have to manually select your range, which is, you know, just fine and whatnot. But, you know, it, it was cheap and expensive and, well, dad got it for me. So I have a digital multimeter that's probably going to be my go-to multimeter for a lot of dicier stuff because... This one, because now I have this beast right here from a uh, friend of mine, Cronus, who got it for me for my birthday as well. And this is an expensive multimeter, but best of all, it's auto ranging. So you just pick what you're measuring, and then it will automatically range itself. Um, it will automatically range itself. I've already tested it. It works exceptionally well. Um, I'm probably not going to be using this for like dicier measurements because, well, this is a nice multimeter. I don't want to blow it up. So I have that. But in that same little box where I found all my electronics tools, I found my snips. I've been missing these so much. You know, you, you, any electronics workbench needs a good pair of snips. So I found my snips. And I also found my cheap little wire strippers. But, I mean, you have to know the gauge of the wire you're stripping, but, I mean, still, I actually found my proper wire strippers, so I don't have to use, I don't have to um, manually use these t these or similar to strip wires anymore. And I even found my screwdriver set. So, yay. Up until now, I've been stuck using a pros kit set that is made specifically for servicing Apple products, which, you know, basically means it has mostly tools and the few bits necessary for taking apart something like my iPhone or my MacBook. But um, this has, you know, a much bigger variety of stuff in it. So I'm glad that I was able to find this screwdriver set. Yay. So anyways, um, I guess with all the, um, I guess with all of that out of the way, let's get started with the build. So for building, for, for a bench top power on like an electronics workbench or just any sort of workbench or whatever, there's a variety of solutions out there on the market. You can get like these super long, like they're several feet long um, power strips that have, you know, a bunch of widely spaced outlets on them. You can find those at a hardware store. They're a little pricey, but if you want to have like a whole bunch of outlets spaced evenly across the, along the length of your workbench, they're a good thing to get um, if you can afford it. Or if not, you can get like a cheap little power strip, you know, kind of like this, which I'm currently using to power my um, power my uh, lights. Um, but the problem with these is is that this long, skinny form factor just isn't really ideal for my own needs. And so I decided, you know what? 
I am going to make my own because the power strips that I can find that are not quite so long and skinny are also not cheap either, um, which is kind of a nuisance. So I'm going to make my own. I'm going to use it using stuff that you can find at pretty much just any neighborhood hardware store. In fact, this is a little project that just about anybody with just about any skill level can do. So without further ado, let's bring in the bag of goodies. So the most important part, well, one of the most important parts of this, of course, is how am I going to plug it into the wall? So I bought this little extension cord that I'm going to hack up. And the main reason I got the extension cord is because extension cords often feature stranded conductors or stranded core conductors instead of solid core. Um, so that way they're a lot easier to wind up and work with. I mean, you can tell just how easily I can flex this little... Um, you know, this little part of the extension cord. So I got stranded, um, which is technically not stranded is basically not used inside walls of homes. Um, you know, for like uh, building for like building code and stuff like that. But for like, um, just power cords going from the out from the uh, receptacle at the wall to the device, you know, stranded is, you know, perfectly fine to use. So I figured, you know, I'll just use this. Uh, I'll use that for that. And then I also got some bare stranded, um, some bare stranded wire, again, from the hardware store. This is going to be used inside, um, inside the um, box or boxes, rather, um, instead of having to, like, you know, strip a whole bunch of outer sheath off of this and cut lengths off. I basically got about three feet of this, basically got about like three feet of this stuff to work with. Um, and of course I bought a bunch of receptacles. These are just standard, uh, these are just, you know, standard duplex type receptacles. Um, so, you know, basically I'm just going to be uh, using these. So I'm going to be building two power blocks for myself. So it's going to be a double gang of duplex receptacles. Um, that way I can have some room for like, that way I can have, you know, a couple places to, uh, plug stuff in. Um, so I've got that. And, you know, these are about like three bucks a piece at like Home Depot or Lowe's or something like that. Um, you can get just about whatever brand you'll find. You can find at whatever hardware store is in your hometown because these things have to be designed to building code. So, you know, you can get just whatever brand is available, you know, for whatever price it is. Like, you can shop around for the absolute cheapest. I just went with whatever was available at my local Home Depot. Um, so there's that. And, of course, face plates to make it look a little pretty. I'm eventually going to uh, put this inside of, um, uh oh, I think one of them is, I think one of them is open because a screw escaped. I think one of these was open because a screw, because uh, a uh, screw escaped, but anyways, but, but uh, anyways, so, um, I'm going to be uh, eventually putting these power blocks. Uh, I'm going to be building like a little, um, essentially like a wood, um, a wooden box for them to put them in. But for right now, though, I'm just building like bare bones. But the face plates are to still make it look at least a little bit pretty. I'm going to put these off to the side here because I'm not going to need them for the moment. And then I got these for the actual. Uh, for the actual box itself, boxes because I'm making two. You can get any kind of you can get any kind of electrical box that you want to get. I just like these because um, because well, it's not just the the design of the shape, but also because as you can see, the screw and the side plate here, these are gangable. So you can actually just take your screwdriver. Let's see. Screwdrivers unwieldy. I got that. I got that. I'm borrowing that screwdriver for the moment. But basically, you can, you know, undo the screw a little bit, and well, it's supposed to be gangable. Oh, twice off. So you know, you take off this side piece right here, and then undo this screw right here. And 
just like that. You see from there you can gang them together. Just like that. So if you want to hitch them up. So actually I should probably do this in a way that you can see, but you see it has these little clips and whatnot. So you can basically you know gang them up just like that. You do the screw in just like that. These are these are just a little bit more expensive than the boxes that you know already come in like you know one gang or two gang type. But the really convenient part about these gangable boxes like this is you can also make three gang, four gang. You can even make five or six gang boxes using these things when normally you can't really get those you know nice and readily. So. I got these because I like them because in the future I can take an already made um, an already uh, made and designed or well not designed an already pre-made uh, power block and I can extend it by ganging another one of these onto the side getting a new uh, face plate and everything building a new wooden box for it all but I can actually expand it extend and um, you know make it just a little bit bigger so that's why I got these so for now though I'm going to go ahead gang and just because I'm already doing this I'm going to go ahead and gang the other two up and we'll get back to them in a minute once I'm done ganging them so I'm going to do this screw right here that comes right off just like that and they fit together they slot in just like puzzle pieces so that is box number one and box number two. There we go, just like that. All right. All right, so we're going to set those aside, come back to them in a minute. Because the next thing I want to do, of course, plugs because they need plugs. I'll show you why in a minute. So we're going to come back to this extension cable here. Stay put. Um, slip it up the sleeve. Whee! Now this is a 25 foot extension cord. I'm only going to need two pieces. I'm going to keep those tie wraps because I really like the plastic. I really love the plastic sheath twi twisty ties. Um, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to do something probably just a little bit unusual. Mm, good lord, this is, uh, this is going to be big and long and unwieldy. Oh lord. Um, I think I may have bitten off more than I could chew at my workbench. Um... I may have already just tangled this as well. Hang on. Ugh. So, anyways, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to cut this extension cord into fourths. So we're going to start like this. With these plugs kind of, well, level with each other. We're basically going to just run along the length of the wire, just like this going to hold it level with itself and looky there it's already twisted around on itself slightly oh god please don't become a horrible mess to deal with <laughs> so like that and first thing we are going to do is right here I'm going to take these Lyman's cutters these Lyman snips that I'm borrowing for the moment we're going to <coughs> cut that in half just like that and then for each half, I'm going to rewind, go back in reverse, just like that. And then we're going to take each half and we're going to split it apart. So we're going to start with this half here. And it's already tangled. <laughs> oh, dear lord. 
In fact, it's twisting around everything. And it's twisting around everything. And, uh, and, and uh, I need to pause for just a quick moment. And I'm back. Okay, so we're going to take that other half and save it for just a moment. Because now what I want to do is cut this length into quarters. So start just like this. Go through. Just like this. And I'm about to lose that teeny tiny little screw that I want to save. Um, so I'll go through just like this to this fold right here. And Snip it, just like that. Go back to the other end. This is how you cut a cable into quarters without a ruler on hand. So this end right here with the uh, plug on it, with the uh, well female plug on it, I'm going to save for later because I might actually because I might actually need this. This piece, however. I'm going to save for this project because I will need it. And then we're going to take this other end right here, this other half, we're going to cut it in half as well. And that's going to give us four approximately equal length quarters. So again, start with uh, the wires mostly level, just like that. And then we go through all the way to this end right here. And then uh, cut that in half, just like that. And then what I'm going to do is separate these. And this half with the plug on it, I'm also going to set aside and save. You're probably wondering why I'm not going to be using this, because it would be you know easier since it already has the plug on it. And that's mostly because, well, I'm just being a little bit anal about both my power blocks looking more or less the same. So now I have two approximately six foot length um, lengths of essentially mains rated, uh, essentially mains rated um, power cord. So now we can use this. So first things first, I think I'm actually going to go ahead and get these plugs put on it. So first off, I want to open one of these up first and I made and I made especially sure to get uh, plugs that were grounded specifically that were grounded um, so that way I could um, so that way I could um, actually use eventually use an oscilloscope I mean actually because I've got an oscilloscope arriving in the mail in the next couple of days from a friend of mine it's basically her old used oscilloscope that she doesn't that uh she doesn't need because she upgraded to a new nicer more expensive oscilloscope and because of that i need to make sure that my power blocks have a ground path because oscilloscopes measure everything with respect to ground so i'm gonna see that oh where are you gonna pop off easily there we go. So that should work. So we unwind all of this, just like that. And then so you are not 10 gauge, not 12 gauge either. I believe you are 14 gauge. So strip out, strip about half an inch back. Uh. not quite going in, or not quite biting in enough. So I'm wondering if it's 16 gauge stranded. Oh yeah, that's biting the insulation a lot more now. Not enough, but it's biting a lot more. 
probably went out of frame there for a second because I was trying to get a close look at everything. And Okay, well, I'm getting more of the insulation off. I don't want to go down to 18 gauge because it's definitely not 18 gauge. So let's finish this up with my much, which my, with my much sharper snips. And I think I just cut a couple of the strands in there. Bollocks. Yes, I did. Wow. Oh, bollocks. I cut a whole lot of, cut a bunch of the strands. That's why you don't use, that's why you just don't use snips for stripping wire, unfortunately. But that's the ground, so not too terribly fussed about it. The hut, however, Need to make sure. That I don't you lose too many of the strands. Well, this is proving to be a pain in the arse. I'm going to have to resort to using my sharp snips mostly for cutting into that last little bit of the insulation. Uh, dang it, why are you not cutting? Technical difficulties were encountered in the making of this video. <laughs> oh. There we go. There we go. And not a single copper conductor was harmed. Oh yeah. Okay, so there's that. So now we got to do white. So we cut all around just like that. And then we try to we try to pull the insulation off. Let's see how well that works. Ugh. Surprisingly well. I think I was out of frame there for that, but couldn't be helped. Okay, so now <laughs> I have the lugs. to wrap the wire around. Okay, so at first let's see here, what do we got here? So at first this is not particularly um, this is not particularly intuitive at first. I mean you can tell the green lug is for ground, but you know, which one is which on this side? Especially considering this is not a polarized plug. Um, so let's pull open one of these to find out. Because I've already looked at one of these on the back side and they are labeled which, uh, which color is which. So obviously that's ground. Um, and which one is this? So it looks like brass is black and this white, the white terminals are white. So we'll go with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so white terminal is white. So what we need to do is we need to 
And basically, you need to basically curl this around so that it will hook around the terminal. You need to do the same thing for this one. Curl them around so they'll hook around the terminal. Or hook around the lug, rather. So kind of like that. And then what we do is, well, obviously, we hook the wires onto the lugs. Just like that. Like that. And oh, if I can fit this ground in there. Come on, ground. Squeeze in there. Ah. I have to retry that. I'm going to have to redo this by going with the ground, by leading with the ground first. I think this is very, very close proximity. To each other. So it's kind of difficult ah, to get your hands in there. There we go. Just like that. And just like that. So once they are hooked on, this is a nice thing about a lot of about a lot of electrical stuff in the United States, at least. They make it pretty easy and self-explanatory. To actually put this together. It's not fully underneath the lug. There we go. Oh, it's a bit more underneath the lug. See, just like that. And then ground gets tightened down. Oh, let's see if I can get a little bit more of that underneath the Oh, lug. There we go. A little bit more of that under the lug so we'll have good contact. And then this closes just like that. And oh, bollocks, I do not have very good contact on the strain relief of the, for the outer sheath. Oh, well. So that that will that will more or less generally hold. So the strain the strain relief clips are really supposed to hold on to the outer sheath, but apparently did not make. I trimmed it back just a little bit too far. Oh well, it'll hold. So there's that. Oh, I need, I need something for my brow. It's warm in here. Okay. So there's number one taken care of. So we'll take that, set it off to the side. Now for number two. El numero dos. So once again. We cut through the outer sheath to strip it back. So just like that. Oh, I need to open this up as well. You see, these are all things that you can find at your hard at your local hardware store, like super duper, super duper easy as well. So, plus it's fun to build stuff. So there we have that. We have that, and then we have that, uh, just like that. Ugh. My, my 
my brow again because it's hot in here. H O T hot. So uh, it's probably only barely gonna bite down on the outer sheath, but oh well. So now Guess what? Yep, we have the fun part of stripping these ends. So we have our black lead. Strip back about half an inch, give or take. Yeah, these are definitely 16 gauge. Instead of actually squeezing down on the handle, let's just use the sharp edge of the snips to actually finish sawing through this a last little bit of insulation so it's not giving us trouble when we try to pull it off. Ugh, come on. There we go. There we go. There's that, and did I end up pulling a couple of... No, I didn't. Okay, good. For a second there, I was afraid I ended up breaking some of the conductors, which is not something you want to happen on either the black or the white wires. Because in the United States Electrical Code, black and white are your alive and neutral, and green right here is your ground. So this one, it's okay. If if you end up um, if you end up accidentally cutting through a couple of the strands, it's not ideal, but it's okay because ground is you know very rarely ever needed. Um, most of your power basically goes through live and neutral. So yeah, I'm gonna make sure that I don't damage the the uh, electrical conductors inside these. So. Uh, there we go. I keep going out of frame with this, but I keep having to get it get this up close to my eyes where I can actually see things. I've got a new webcam on the way, along with a boom arm for said webcam, so that way I can more or less prevent this issue by putting by positioning the webcam a little bit closer to where I actually work. And it's going to be a much higher webcam than this, so soon you'll be able to see my videos in glorious 1080 HD. And it will be progressive scan 1080 as well, not interlaced. There we go. And there's that, and not a single strand is damaged. Good. And so now it's time to strip this ground. Also in the United States, uh, electrical code ground itself can come either as a green sheathed wire like this or as a bare conductor. Just to give you a hint as to you know how rarely used ground actually is, the electrical states can uh, the uh, United States electrical code actually allows ground to be a bare copper wire. If it's a bare copper wire, it has to be a solid conductor, obviously, but it actually allows for ground to be a bare conductor. That's how rarely it's actually needed. So now we fold this over. Basically fold these around so they'll fit on the screw lugs, just like in the other plug. And we're gonna have to do this again for the other end of both of these. I just want to get the little plugs out of the I just want to get the uh, actual plug ends out of the way 
for the time being. Because we're going to be needing this for connecting all these duplexes together. Okay, so now that that's done, oh, let's see here. I'm going to have to sort through this. So black needs to go on that side. Okay, so hook that around. Hook that around and hook that onto the well. And then hook white onto the white screw terminal. So ground obviously goes on the green screw terminal, black goes on the brass colored screw terminal, and they're already trying to pull off, which is, you know, a nuisance. down just a little bit so I can get in there. Okay, so I'm going to have to redo that one just slightly. I think I made a bad choice getting these this style of male plug, but I didn't want I did not want super, super bulky plugs like this. So, sometimes you gotta sacrifice convenience for style. Get that secured just a little bit. Double check the white. I can't get my pliers in there. Oh, I think tightening the screw will fix it though. Tightening the screw goes the opposite direction of the, the of this hook, so oh, one of those conductors did snap weeks. So I gotta make sure that this is especially secure. There we go. So now that those are uh, snug and secure, let's tighten them so they won't come undone. There we go. Just like that. And then, oh, look at that. That's closing down nicely around the outer sheath for strain relief. Oh yeah, I like that. I'm probably going to be using this one for like my actual tools because the other power block I'm just going to be using for powering my bench lights and my microphone. There we go. So there's that. Okay. So, next bit. Got to connect these together. So, Basically, the way these work, and the nice thing I like about uh, home electrical stuff in the United States is it's basically all it's all effectively self-explanatory, which is really really nice and really really convenient that everything is so self-explanatory. So now what we do, I'm gonna leave that aside for the moment because. I gotta connect this together. Uh, what gauge was this again? Doesn't say. Oh, right, duh. It says what gauge it is on the wire sheath. Toss that aside. Because that's going in the trash later. Okay, so. I now have. So here, what is what gauge was this again? Uh, 12 gauge. It says right here on the sheath, AWG 12, American wire gauge. So I need, first and foremost, uh, let's go with about, yeah, about that much. Huh. <coughs> 
Okay, well, I made indentations, so I can actually snip it. Snip. Snip. And snip. All right. So once again, we strip it. So now we go to the 12 gauge, the 12 gauge hole, and we start our stripping process, which is going to take a little bit, I think. <laughs> it's not going all the way through the insulation. Cheap wire strippers. Gotta love them. Even 16 gauge is not going all the way through the insulation. What the heck? I really need a better pair of wire strippers. Oh, there we go. Oops. There we go. Oh yeah, look at that. That's beautiful. All right, so let's go back to 12 gauge. Let's see if we can strip this properly. gauge ain't working or 12 gauge ain't working so let's go to 14 there we go now I can actually rotate the wire and uh, get the sheath nicely cut all the way around or well insulation rather there we go Oh, come on. Ah. And there we go. Alrighty. Okay, so now I've got a little bit of a problem here. There's only one ground on each of these. And I need to be able to... See, there's only one ground on each of these, and there's one ground from here, so I'm going to have to figure out some way to make this work. So I think what I may have to do... Hmm... So I can figure this out here. How far out can I unscrew you, or are you already as far out as it'll go? You're already as far out as you'll go. Of course. Oh, so it's gonna be I'm gonna be hard pressed to actually make these fit together. I probably should have cut longer lengths of wire, come to think of it. I should have cut longer lengths of wire because it's going to be some tight, there's going to be some close quarters for all this. Let's fold this over and let's see if we can make everything fit. I think what I may have done is gotten 
Ugh, wire that's just way too big gauge for this project because the extension cord that I got is only rated for 13 amps and this wire right here is rated for 15. But air on the excess makes ensures that you have plenty of ensure air on the excess makes sure you have plenty of wiggle room. So meh. That'll do. Oh, get in there. Oh, I am not going to be able to fit all all of my ground wire on all of these. Oh, that's going to be such a pain in the butt. I probably should have gotten I should have gotten thinner, I think. Hmm. Well, I can save that for later. Because we can improvise. What I will simply do is quick about save out you know, six or eight inches, give or take. Oh, it doesn't really, doesn't really matter how much I actually <coughs> snip off. But we'll snip that off, and then what we will do is cut this outer sheath off. Since this is all twisted around each other, oh, this is going to take a bit. This is going to take a lot longer than I originally anticipated. Oh well. Okay, so I think I have enough of this cut back. I should be able to just simply... There we go. So there's that. And then I can simply unravel that. Okay. So now that I have these much smaller wires to play with. Let's start stripping. So, uh, come on. There we go. Damaged conductors. Again. Damaged strands again. Oh well. Okay. Alright, so. Do 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 ba do do do. So there's that and 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 that. Do 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 like that until we can go all the way, until we can actually rotate it, essentially. This is extremely, extremely flexible insulation. Oh, well, th then again, this also came out of a flexible extension cord, so that kind of makes sense. There we go. Just like that. Twist, twist it up a bit so it stays together just a little bit more. And there we go. So we have that.
We have a nice flexible, we have a nice flexible round lead. So we fold that over into a nice stranded copper hook, just like that. And then we do the same thing over here. Now, let's test it. Let's see here. Because I want to be able to... Oh yeah, I should be able to fit... Oh yeah, I should be able to fit a second one underneath there perfectly. It'll fit barely, but it will fit. Excellent! Alright, so the next thing to do... is start getting these boxes ready. Your screwdriver because it has a lower chance of stripping the screw as I'm getting it past that spot where the threads are damaged because apparently all four of these screws have slightly damaged threads all around the same spot. So we'll just use a little bit of slightly, slightly unreasonable force to back those screws out because we're not going to need all of these. We are going to need one, however. We are going to need one because these are called knockouts. If I can actually <sighs> get my screwdriver around one. Let's see, you fold it back just like that. I need an actual serious pair of pliers for this, I think. Or I can just fold it back and forth a bunch of times and use work fatigue. Okay, so the idea is these are called knockouts. So you basically knock it out. And the idea is to slip the mains wire through here and use one of these clips to basically hold it down in place. So now what we do is we take this. Right. We slip this through, just like that. Right. We slip this through the knockout, just like that. put this down here out of the way for now. You're going to strip back several inches of insulation this time around, or several inches of sheath, outer sheath, this time around. So I got plenty of slack in the actual conductors inside. side and crap. Can't use this now. Or I can't use that segment now. Because unfortunately I have damaged the uh, insulation. But I can still keep these pieces of wire. I just can't use that for my actual project now because unfortunately damaging the outer insulation like that is renders it completely unsafe in terms of electrical building code. So what I'm doing right here is technically not really all that safe either, but 
what can you do when you have limited tools? Oh crap. And the downside to using flexible wire like this is the manufacturer also uses a flexible sheath. So it's that much harder to work with because, well, I mean, the sheath likes to bend and stretch and stuff. So there's wrong, wrong strippers. I should not use my snips to strip wire. Should be like one of those things where you have to write it a bazillion times on the high, on the uh, school chalkboard. I I should not use my strips to strip wire. I should not use my snips to strip wire. I should not use my snips to strip wire. And just be like that scene from the Simp uh, be like that scene from the Simpsons where Bart Simpson, well, in the introduction of the Simpsons, rather because I've never really watched the Simpsons, but in the introduction, you know, it shows a little brief snippet of Bart Simpson writing on the chalkboard. about something bad that he did. Never really, never, Bart never really learned not to do that kind of stuff though. He was pretty much your, he was pretty much your stereotypical American delinquent kid. He mean, as far as I'm aware though, he meaned well. It's just the kind of kid that was, you know, bored. So he was always getting himself into trouble. doing crank calls that sometimes backfire, sometimes work splendid firstly and get people in trouble. <laughs> I just went off into Timbuktu. <laughs> just pull this off and just goes, wee! Off into the middle of nowhere. Okay. Do -do 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 -do. Here we go. Strip back about half an inch, give or take. That'll be plenty of exposed copper to wrap around the screw terminal. And I can already tell I have damaged some conductors on the live. Urgh, this is frustrating. Yep. Slightly damaged, but they're not detached, which is good. Okay. So that's that. Let me loop that over just like that. Loop that over just like that. And we loop that over just like that. Alright, so that's got these ready. So now we've got to prepare these. Just like that. Get this to the. I gotta strip both ends of this. This soft and flexible insulation is a pain in the butt to strip. Royal pain in the butt to strip. Royal pain in my butt. Okay, you know what? <sighs> there. Okay. So now onto this end. There you go. my wire strippers aren't working like they should because they're cheap. 
gonna resort to the sharp edge of my snips to finish the job. Oh, come on. I'm sorry I don't really have any sort of stories to be all rambly about. Unfortunately, I'm quite young and, you know, not terrifically experienced as, you know, folks like, you know, Dave Jones of EV Blog or, well, Big Clive of, you know, BigClive.com. I'm not as terribly experienced as those gentlemen, so unfortunately I don't have any interesting work stories to go, to be all rambly about when I'm doing something like this, but, oh well, this is still fun to do regardless. Oh, this real little conductor trying to be all free willy on me. Nope, you are going to stay twisted up with your brethren. Just like that. And hooked over, just like that. All right. One more wire to go. So let's strip this bit of insulation right here. And as per usual, my strippers cannot complete the job on their own, so they require a little bit of sharp assistance from the snips. <clears throat> Son of a biscuit. Okay, I think that's... Yeah, that sheath is fully detached. There we go. And then snip, and then these go over here. Little cheap wire strippers that can't do their job. Because they'd rather cut the stranded wire rather than the sheath, which is a nuisance. Oh, let's see how. That should be good. Oh, come on. Break, break, break. Yes. And there we go. There's that. And then we fold that over, just like that, into a nice, lovely hook to hook around the screw. Then we fold that over into a nice, lovely hook to hook around the screw. And just like that. Okay. So now... Everything should be ready to connect it together. So, first order of business is connect the white. If I can get the wire in there, come on, get in there. Are you screwed as far out as you go? You'll, you're screwed out as far as you'll go. Okay. Um, stripped it far enough, but oh well, we will use slightly unreasonable force to force it in there. Okay, so there's just like that. Oh, stay put. gross misappropriation of multimeter probe, but oh well, I need I need a sharp point to get down in there, so there we go. Just like that. And since this and uh I think technically the screw's not supposed to bite down on the insulation like that, but I will be I'll be testing with the multimeter here in a minute and get you out of my way. So just like that. And this one. Get in there. 
Okay. We need to widen the hook slightly. There we go. One screw bites down and makes contact. Oh, just like that. And then nice and secure. Okay, so that's white. Black goes on the brass. So I need to widen that hook slightly. Once again, gross misappropriate. Once again, gross misappropriation of multimeter test lead, but the sharp point gets it in there. Hmm. I need to hook this around the, different, the other way this way. So the screw will actually bite down and pull it in. Like that. So that makes good, pretty good contact. Good enough. Um, Okay. Now, okay. So, what direction do you go in again? You go in. Uh, that. Okay. So, yeah, lefty, loosey, right and tidy, as usual. And yes, that's how I actually remember it: is lefty, loosey, righty, tidy. That's that is a common mnemonic in. The American hardware industry when dealing with anything that uses a screw threaded tap in North America. Lefty Lucy, righty tighty. There we go. So there's that. Okay, so now. You can connect it in so I'm gonna go ahead and connect which one of you that doesn't really matter actually um okay so Again, you gotta widen this slightly so it'll slip into the slip into the screw terminal just like that. Make sure we're turning the screw the correct direction. Very important. Ground is perhaps the most important connection in all of in all of building code worldwide, simply because it's what makes things safe from you know giving you an undue an undue trip to the ER. Well, generally, it's supposed to make things safe, particularly if you know whatever thing you have has a chassis. Especially a metal chassis. All right, now here's the hard part: is fitting two ground leads onto one screw terminal, and oh, that'll fit perfect! Yay! And just hold them in place while I tighten the screw, and hopefully the screw bites down on them both. It does. Score. All right. Cool. Okay, so now the fun part is stretching. 
all of these. <sighs> Getting all of these around the screw terminals so I can tighten them. There we go. So there's that. Just like that. All right, and then this is where things become a bit of a mess. And widen that slightly, and then this goes on just like that. I have to admire electricians for being willing to work with this kind of stuff on a daily basis. Because for the sake of being compact, it sure is a pain in the butt to work with. Okay. So that's held in. That's held in nice and secure. Just like that. So now that all of this is connected together, what I can do is reel it in. Like this. And what I can do is you know, reel this wire in. Unfortunately, I went off frame again because I'm completely unaware of where my camera is. Alright. This is the fun part, is getting all of this to fit in here and stay in here. Okay, so now that I know approximately where the cable is... Right, right, right. right make sure that I actually have enough cable to be able to pull things out to service them, so... Hey, you're not supposed to fall off the screw like that. And this is where you can see I need the screwdriver with the chunkier bit for this part. Uh, this is also why I got these boxes as well, because as you can see, it, they basically have built-in stream relief. So just like that. See, I can move things around and shove it in, just like that, and just like that, and hopefully it won't cause any problems. Oh, come on, get in there. There we go. Uh, doesn't want to fully go in, does it? Loosen this up just a bit and I'll allow a little bit more cable in so I can twist it around just a little bit more. There we go. So now Make sure these are facing the correct direction as well. So everything twists around and should be able to just slip right in. Just like that. So now I'm going to use my small screwdriver. Hopefully, possibly. I'm going to start on the front side here, actually. Also, another little pro. That screw is made for chunky screwdrivers. Also, another little pro tip when working with screws, in order to avoid cross-threading, something that my dad taught me to do is you get the screw lined up with the hole, just like this one is, and you go backwards, and 
and you heard that little pop, that was the threads of the screw seating in with the threads of the hole. And that's how you can prevent cross-threading in any situation, is you just take your screw and you very gently run it backwards until you feel it, until you feel its own threads drop into the threads of the hole you're putting the screw into. So it's just like that, just like that. That one goes down in, and now let's get this one in. Once again, get the threads of the screw seated properly so we don't get any cross-threading. It would help if I was able to hold on to the uh, screwdriver as well. So now we just run in these really long screws. <laughs> and these are ridiculously long screws. Run them down almost completely. Because what you want to be able to do is to fine tune the positions of these things so that you line up all the holes. Because these need to be nice and straight. Uh -oh. This one is. A little tightened down, so it's this one and this one. You want to be able to line up the holes, get these nice and neat. So that you'll be able to put the face plate on top. From there, we. Uh, if I can figure out how to open the faceplate. Use my little snips to cut it open. Oh, it's not black! I thought that was a black faceplate. Oh well. It's still, it's close enough. It still looks nice. Just like that. And so. Just like that, and like that. And it should go. These screws should go in nice and easy, but they're not. Because unfortunately, these are not square. That's a nuisance. as I would like them to be. Get this in the middle here where I can back it up and realign them again. Centering. If I can get, I can get it to actually move. There we go. 
These were black face plates. Oh well. I'm not gonna lose too much sleep over because it still looks nice. And I'm eventually going to build a nice wooden case to go around these to make them look a lot nicer. Come on, screw it. Get in there. Are you going in? You're not going in. That one went in, and now for this one over here. Oh, this is so dicey. I have a feeling the way this was supposed to work is I was supposed to put all the screws into the faceplate first and then put the faceplate on while it's holding onto all the screws for me. You know what, I'm going to try it that way. So. Oh shit, the screws are... Wow, I can actually just press them in. Okay, that's convenient. I'm just press it in, press it in. And then press it in just like that. And from there, that is convenient. Oh, from there, I can sort of make the screw fit. God, I do not envy electricians for having to deal with stuff that won't align properly. I do not envy electricians one bit for having to deal with this kind of stuff. And not only having to deal with stuff that won't always align properly, but also having to deal with the work of the previous electrician if the previous electrician was incompetent and didn't give a single flip about building code and wired stuff up so badly and wrongly that it's a wonder that things haven't caught fire yet. But yeah, there we go. Let's get these screws tightened down. Just that smidgen a little bit more. Since these are decorator style, they do protrude ever so slightly. It's not perfect, but it works. Well, it looks nice. So now, the important bit is, did I wire this up correctly? And to do that, we will need to test it. 
So, before we actually plug it in though, I want to do a quick little lesson about AC mains using an extension cable that I already have on hand. So, plugged in, this thing is live. We'll use this multimeter right here. So, AC mains, as we all know in North America, is effectively 120 volts RMS at 60 hertz sine wave. Uh, and I say 120 volts RMS because RMS is the effective voltage of an AC sine wave. Well, 120 volts is the effective voltage of the AC sine wave. It's technically, I think it's more around like 130 something volts peak to peak in actuality. Um, but the effective voltage is about 120 volts. So if we so if we measure the live and the neutral pins on this socket right here, says Scott, nonchalantly shoving the probes of his multimeter into a live electrical socket, it should measure somewhere around the order of 120 volts. And it does, about 117 volts, that's close enough. Right? So there's that. Now in order for AC to work, I'm going to unplug these here. In order for AC to work, your alternating signal your alternating current signal has to oscillate around effectively a known or assumed reference voltage. Now, in terms of mains electricity, that reference voltage is zero volts, and so your and so your power and so your uh, essentially your power signal, your, your power, your yeah, your AC uh, power basically oscillates plus minus sixty volts RMS around zero volts. And that's technically supposed to be zero volts with respect to ground, but sometimes, you know, it's just a little bit off. So this sense is, so here in the United States, this is a standard NEMA plug. These are NEMA receptacles here. Um, this is actually a polarized, or this is able to accept a polarized plug. So you can see one of these is slightly longer than the other. Um, so one of these is going to be hot and one of these is going to be, or one of these is going to be live. We also call it hot here in the United States. And one of these is going to be neutral or, you know, not hot. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this probe and we are once again going to shove it into this socket right here, being careful not to touch anything metal at all. And we're going to put this into ground. And as we can see, and this probe is making contact with metal. Uh, I can go back and actually get a closer look in there. Yep. Okay, this probe is making contact with metal, and the meter is measuring effectively zero volts with respect to ground. So that means the wide plug in a standard United States polarized socket, or you know, the wide prong is supposed to be neutral. So just to double check that, let's shove this probe into what we what we think is the live socket, and voila, about 120-ish volts with respect to ground. So, with that in mind, unplug that, because we don't need it anymore. Let's bring this back over here. And these are tamper resistant, so they're going to be just a little bit more difficult to actually probe. We're basically going to plug this in and hope things don't blow up. Things are not blowing up yet. So, now what we need to do is we need to test it. Okay, and get these probe wires untangled here. So, get this in there. Measures about 120 volts. All right, and let's contact, make contact with ground. Approximately zero volts with respect to ground. Touch ground again. 120 volts with respect to ground. All right, and then we shove into here, into the other one, because we got to check both outlets in the duplex. So 120 volts between live and neutral, zero volts with respect to ground, and 120 volts with respect to ground. So got this wired up perfectly. So now the next best thing to do, I suppose, is to test it out. Um, well, let's bring this back in, because this is my phantom power supply for my microphone. So we'll plug that in, just like that. 18 volts in, and does it power on? It powers on. Excellent.
So this is the first of two power blocks that I'm going to be building for myself. I don't think I'm going to build the second one in this video because this one, this video has probably gone on long enough. But now you know how you can essentially build your own little um, homebrew um, power block for your workbench. And you can build it using cheap materials ready, at, ready to find at your local hardware store. And pretty much it just requires just a little bit of work to put it together. But you can have a nice Nice little power block here. I'm going to build a little cabinet on the. I'm going to build a little cabinet to put this in so that it basically has it mounted at a 45 degree angle, kind of like this. So that way, you know, it's not lying completely flat where, you know, plugs are just, you know, sticking straight up out and, you know, having to go down where it's not, you know, vertical like this, where it can sometimes be just a little bit difficult to actually plug things in because, you know, it'll just go, you know, sliding across the bench. But a 45 degree angle like this, you know, plugs will come off gracefully at a nice, arc like this and I can plug in plug them in and it shouldn't slide around too much but that's for a later date that I'll build the wooden cabinet for this and I'll build a and you know I'm gonna build a twin a twin power block for this and also build a wooden box for it but for now though I'm gonna keep it just like this just leave it sitting I guess leave it sitting flat on my bench for the time being but yeah that's one of two uh, power blocks I'll be building the second one after I get done with this video um, but yeah, so that's basically it. It's really not that hard to put something like this together as long as you have your head about you and you remember, you know, and you remember, um, black is hot, white is not, green is ground, green for ground, uh, green for ground, obviously. I don't know why in the United States hot is the black wire and white is the neutral. I don't know why, but that's how it is in the United States, um, electrical color code, black, hot, white, not. So as long as you can remember that black, hot, white, not green ground and connect everything according, accordingly, you know, white connects to pull out another one of these here because everything is actually standardized to a color code. So, you know, white actually connects to the white screws, whereas black, your hot lead connects to the brass screws. And of course, ground obviously connects to your green colored uh, terminals, just like this. You know, it's essentially color coded to be foolproof so that even somebody who's not an electrician can put stuff together like this. Now, if you're not an electrician, of course, you do not, do not, you know, install anything like this into, into the wall unless you are, unless you like double, triple, quadruple check exactly what you're doing and you make sure that, you know, your white is connected to white, black to brass, you know, green to green, just like this, you know. Ideally, if you're not an electrician, you should not be putting stuff like this into the wall. But since I'm not installing this into the wall at all, I'll never be installing this into the wall. I feel a lot more confident and comfortable putting this together myself. As in, you know, if things start to happen, you know, it's like right here on top of my bench where I can just unplug it real quick and then, you know, end the problem. Whereas if this were mounted in the wall and it had problems, you know, I'd have to run halfway across the house to trip the circuit breaker for my room after I hunt it down inside the breaker box. You know, I'd have to, you know, cut the electricity to my entire room and then manually extract this from the wall, assuming it hasn't already caught fire, which also the other reason why I put this inside of a metal one of these instead of plastic, even though the plastic ones are rated for some level of fireproofness. Um, if a fire does spark up or anything like that, it'll be mostly contained by the steel. Um, so by keeping this, you know, out of the wall on my bench and stuff like that, if a problem happens, I can just unplug it real quick and deal with the problem right then and there. Whereas, you know, if this were in the wall and this had problems, well, like I said, there's a lot, there's a lot more of a process involved to dealing with the problem and thus, you know, a lot more potential for that little problem to become a much bigger problem. So, you know, if you're going to be doing something like this, installing it into the wall, get a licensed electrician to do this. Seriously, I can't stress that enough. You know, get a licensed electrician to do this. I've tried playing with, you know, outlets like this once before. Um, and one time I actually went in to pull the outlet out and stupid me, it did not turn off the uh, circuit breaker for the room. I reached in, grabbed the outlet just like this and gave myself quite a nasty shock off these screw terminals because these are live at mains voltage, these screw terminals around the side. And it's way too easy to just reach in and pull it out and give yourself a shock. So reasons why I'm not an electrician, <laughs> even though I play with electricity. Um, 
So, you know, if you're doing stuff like this, just get a licensed electrician to deal with it. Seriously. But this is not going in the wall, so I've made this. I'm going to use it. Anyways, that's my uh, geek out for today. And I'll be building another one of these, and I'll have some power block, nice power blocks for my desk. And I think tomorrow I'll have a nice little teardown video for my of my microphone power supply. But until then, have fun geeking out with me. Catch you later. Nick. Bonus note. I seem to have found a, uh, well, I seem to have rediscovered a much better way to strip wires than using, you know, these cheap piece of crap wire strippers, which I'm going to be putting away for a long time, for a long time now, and especially better than using these because, you know, these can just, you know, snip right through individual strands in a multi-strand conductor, and that is my trusty pocket knife. And before, essentially before the invention of the wire stripper, which I'm sure was invented shortly after the electrical wire was invented, um, actually just in the absence of having a wire stripper on hand, you know, if you have a nice sharp blade, you can actually strip a wire just by doing this number with your pocket knife. As long as you are careful, apply just a little bit of pressure with your thumb to press the wire against the blade, Nice, clean strip. Just like that. I really should have tried this out, you know, the first time I was making the video, but I was kind of committed to staying at my workbench as much as possible to finish this, and my pocket knife was halfway across my bedroom. But I have my pocket knife in my hand right now, and to show you how much faster this is going, I mean, look at how clean that cut is. That is a beautiful clean cut right through the insulation and the blade only slightly nicks the outermost bit of the strands of course this probably would not work very well in you know, like very fine gauge stranded wire um, because you know the much smaller strands would be easier for a pocket knife to actually cut through them but yeah so yeah side note over catch you later